All right, so we can get started. Uh, well, so welcome everyone. Uh, I hope you're having a good conference so far. Um, my name is Damien, Damien Caro. I'm a product manager in the Azure Client Tools. Um, here's my email address and, and uh, handle on social media as you can reach out to me anytime if you have any follow-up questions or if you want to talk with me about any other questions related to Azure Client Tools. Um, but today, I wanted to talk more about a specific topic, which is identity and authentication. It's a very tough topic to do right after lunch when everyone gets into that food coma. Um, but <laughs> we'll try to make it fun and entertaining. And the reason why I wanted to talk about it, especially at that time, it's kind of interesting. You tend to get to work after lunch, and that's when you start doing mistakes uh, because you're not paying attention to what you're doing. Or you're going into that routine, and you're going in your habits, and you could make a few mistakes. But my goal today is to give you the few improvements, talk about the few improvements we're doing to make you to avoid you making those mistakes as you get along with your client tools, Azure, Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell, to not name them. I want to talk about three areas. Um, the first one is what we're doing around the logging experience. You know that first prompt that you, the first uh, step you're doing when you're connecting to Azure with your client tools. Um, We've done some work, and if you haven't been on our blog uh, yesterday afternoon, uh, you probably don't know that. It's the first time we're going to talk about it. Uh, so I'm very excited to present a bit those improvements. Then we'll talk about the authentication update. So it's going to be a bit more dry, but I want to make sure that we talk about how we make it more secure, especially in this, um, uh, those times. <laughs> and we will conclude with best practices, a few things you want to take away uh, when you get to, to your work, uh, things you can apply right away when, you, when you're getting on your desk. One more thing, there are no stupid questions at any time. Raise your hand and I will make a pause. If this is a long topic to discuss, we can take it offline after that, but uh, don't be shy. Raise your hand if you have any questions at any time. So, um, depending on your favorite tool, I, I'm supposing Azure PowerShell would be the one in this conference. Uh, this is the experience you're having when you're connecting with Azure PowerShell today. You run connect as your account, wonderful. Then what's gonna happen is it's going to launch the system browser, uh, your default browser on your machine for interactive use if you don't have any other settings on the command. And we open that tab and we keep it forever. Technically it's open until you close it. If you are uh, switching from subscription to subscription, managing multiple accounts. Uh, if you have to switch accounts over time, uh, you end up having a multiple a series of tabs open and they all have the same page. And at the end of the day, you're like, okay, how many tabs do I have to close? And then the client goes and returns the subscription selected after having a blurb of warning messages. They're all in yellow here, especially if you have multiple tenants. And I'll come to that in a minute, um, but that kind of blurs a bit the experience and, and you know, it's, it's okay, I would say. But the question is, which subscription do I use? And that can be random. Now, if you're more a CLI person, Azure CLI person, uh, your experience will be slightly different. You're going to type easy login on the prompt it will also launch a SIM browser. The tabs will remain open, same problem than you have with Azure PowerShell. And then it returns a JSON object with all subscriptions that you can access. Uh, how many of you have more than 20 subscriptions or access to 20, more than 20 subscriptions, right? And more than one tenant. And that blurb of JSON, how many of you use it? I don't see any hands. <laughs> So even though it's a programmatic, usable approach, um, it's not necessarily the best experience we want to give to, uh, to you. So we've listened to our customers. Um, I'm very keen to hear what everyone has to say. Uh, we listen to feedback through different sources. And we've collected those feedback to kick off a research study. So we have different profile at Microsoft that work on the client tools. 
Uh, one of them is a user researcher, and they help us to work on that study to understand how we can improve the product. That leads to a design, and we have a designer that helped us go through some iterations of what the client through the new experience for logging in could be, leading to a preview. And the preview was released yesterday, so we'll come to that and you can try it out um, until we make it available. So feedback. Feedback, we get feedback from different sources. If you're using either, either Azure CLI or Azure PowerShell, uh, you can open GitHub issues anytime you want, as many as you want. Um, our devs are looking at them every day. As PMs, we review those issues on a weekly basis to understand what's happening, what are the biggest pain points, and it keeps us on track of what is the reality of the world, what, what you're facing on the day-to-day -day basis. You may have seen that we also have surveys, and sometimes you run the command and it pops up the survey. Uh, I read every single feedback that we get through that survey. Every single feedback, I read it, and we categorize all those feedback to understand what's going on. We also do serve interviews. We talk to customers. Um, we say, hey, would you want to talk with us for an hour? And we go through all what's happening with the client tool. What are the pain points? How are you using it? Where are you using it? What are the main challenges you're facing? And social media is the other place we're looking at feedback. We did an aggregation of all those sources over the last um, 18 months or so, and we discovered that logging, logging in was one of the biggest source of dissatisfaction of our customers using the CLIs. Um, it was the biggest and it had been recurring for a longer period of time. So that's when we started to do research. So our research step is getting in more in-depth discussion with customers. We sit on the table, we have that phone call going on, and we take customers from various origins. Um, we take customers from Europe, we take customers from Africa, from Asia, from uh, US, uh, LATAM, or all countries, all continents. Uh, we also try to select customers from different uh, profile, uh, large companies, small companies, um, retail, finance, you name them. And we try to blend all those feedback together to understand what are the common traits and what would be the improvement we should be doing. We discovered four main findings uh, through those interviews, and those are common across the customers we talked to. The first problem was really the unpredictability of the subscription that you're getting when you're logging into your, 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 um, your, your Azure subscription. Um, it turns out that what we're doing here, we are selecting as a default subscription with AZ CLI or Azure PowerShell, the first one that we get from ARM. So the process is the following. You log in, you put your credentials, then we call ARM, and we say, okay, give me all the subscriptions that this account has access to. So we do a list on all those subscriptions. We pick the first one that is returned, and we take it as the default. That seemed to be a very good approach 10 years ago when we started to build those tools, because customers mostly had one subscription. You had few customers who had two, three subscription at most, but that was kind of how big the market was. Now, I have access to 150 subscriptions. <laughs> and I log in uh, in the morning and I would get subscription A. And in the afternoon, I try logging in again, I get subscription D. And who knows why I get A or D? Uh, so it's, it's that random. Um, so, Customer had that problem uh, with the fact that it's most difficult to identify which subscription you want to use. Uh, the, we've, we've done some patches here and there to allow you to select which subscription you would take by default. So we know you have that parameter, you say, I want this one by default, fine. But then I want to switch to a different one. Then you have to go through all kinds of steps to get there. You have to run a command, get the subscription list, get the, find the name, and then from the name get the ID and pass the ID to the command. And, and it's, it's a complicated process, to be honest. It's not straightforward. So some of our customers were saying that they had a notepad with all the subscription IDs and the names, so they would go to the notepad, pick the ID, and paste it in their code. I, any of you do that? 
<laughs> so that, and the other thing is we had a different experience between CLI and PS. The, the, the experience was very different. It's not consistent in the behavior and, and things like that. Finally, you remember this big warning message I got at the login you have that says, hey, you cannot authenticate here or it is not, the permissions are not met. So what happened is when you're logging in with CLI or PS, because we pick the first subscription we have, we also pick the first tenant you can access to. And when you're validating your authentication scheme, you're validating, we are validating that against the first tenant that we use. So the first tenant, let's say tenant A, is authorizing username and password access, which is bad, but let's say it's authorizing a username and password. And then you have tenant B that requires multi-factor authentication on that account. What happened is we've validated the account with non-MFA permissions, non-MFA properties. So when you try to access a subscription on tenant B, you're failing because you haven't, we have not validated that you have MFA. So you end up having an authentication flow that is broken and you have to go back and try again, put the proper IDs and et cetera, et cetera, that I was saying. Okay? So all of some of the problems that you may have encountered or you could encounter at some point in the future. That's what we discovered from customers' interview. Now, we've done few iterations based on those learnings. And those are our prototypes that we worked with our designer, and you will never see. Those are the things that we have been working on in the last few months, and they're trash. <laughs> they're experiments that we've done. We've tried, let me see if I can find the laser here. Yes, laser pointer, here it is. We've tried this approach where you first log in, and your login will list all the tenants uh, that you have access to. So you pick the tenant, and then you would list all the subscription you have access to, and you pick the subscription. Then we talked with customers about that, and they were like, hold on, today I'm, all, I'm having to do three steps, but I know where I'm going. Here you're blocking me three times before I get somewhere. That's not good. So we went back to our designer, wiped the whiteboard, started again, and we end up with a second prototype that is this one. Um, has a bunch of sections with a kind of part of JSON. Like it is like what we have today, but it's not fully what you have, so it's not usable in a way. So again, we talk with customers and are like, no, this is not good. We, we wipe that again. But we don't wipe everything. We don't trash everything of the work we've done. We iterate based on that. And that's the purpose of our process, our design process. So we end up with this new logging experience. And that's the first time we're showing it in public. <laughs> I'm very happy. Uh, we're still taking feedback on that, but I think we've, we've nailed down a good solution that has a combination of usability improvement as well as uh, putting the right thing with a minimum number of steps to get to where you want to be. So first, when you are logging in interactively, and I'm insisting this is an interactive logging only. If you're using programmatic approach, that's not changing. For interactive login, we're going to, dis to display the list of subscription and tenant that you have access to. The one that is selected by default has a different color. It's like a teal color with a little star. Uh, that's the one that we have identified as the one you would pick as default, and I'll come to how that works. Um, and then you have a still an announcement mess, uh, block where we can give some information that they are important. Um, uh, right now we're saying, hey, this is a prototype preview. Please let us know how we're doing, that kind of thing. Um, the color and the star are two things that came from the accessibility uh, design team. So we wanted to make that list accessible to everyone. So the coloring has been geared for, um, for people with uh, uh, visibility uh, deficiencies. And the star is also to make it visible or usable with screen readers and all kinds of things like that. So we've been thinking of all those different aspects here. Um, and Finally, Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell have the same consistent experience. Oops. Nope. Oh. Well, PowerPoint didn't like my consistent experience between CLI and PowerShell. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it doesn't predict the future, but. <laughs> <laughs> so.
So, um, so consistent experience between CLI and PowerShell, and um, let me get there. Maybe I can show the next slide. Here it is. So on the left we have, uh, sorry, on the left we have uh, PowerShell and on the right we have Azure CLI. So it's even difficult for me to know which one is which. Um, so that's, that's what we have. That's the current uh, pro preview that we have for Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. Identical experience and we want to go in that direction going forward. This is something we're really keen to keep uh, going forward. All right, yes, quick question. So the question was, will it have silo pop-up to authenticate? That is the next section <laughs> that I will cover. So very good question. Um, why don't we do a quick demo on this first to see the flow, and then I'll go to the authentication flow and how we can move, uh, uh, and how we are addressing that. I even had a slide for demo, which I don't really need, to be honest. Uh, okay, let's move to uh, my demo environment. So that's my preview. Um, I'm going to run the command, uh, so az login. Um, we're still opening the pop-up because we're still using that authentication flow um, and that's, that's not changing. But what's happening now is in my prompt, we are retrieving the list of tenant and subscription. We are caching that information locally. We are technically putting it in a JSON file. And you have the list of subscription I can access to. So that's what I was saying. Um, I have a bunch of subscription I can access. Um, the one I'm selecting by default is line number 42. Uh, it's easy to see, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted the color, because you know, it's easier to find when you have that huge, humongous list. And let's say I'm on subscription one, but I want to go to subscription uh, 74, which is line 43. Um, so I'm going down, all the way down. And now I just need to type the number. So you can see it's on the bottom. Um, I put that ID. I have a reminder here of what has been selected by default, so I don't have necessary to scroll through the list. If everything is fine, I just need to type enter. But in that case, I said I want to move to uh, subscription 74, so I'm going to type the number. And here we go. Um, after that, I have a reminder of which subscription I've selected um, with the ID and the name, as well as the tenant. And as I said, we have announcement and warning messages, um, which are a few things that we are polishing as we are speaking. Yes, so where are we with these things? So what I'm showing now is the preview that we have today. So that is what I would say the present of the future. <laughs> uh, it is a preview. Our plan is to make that available as the default logging mechanism for our May release. So we are planning to have it as a general availability on May 21st, which is the day of build. Um, so that's when we're going to have that as the default uh, behavior. Uh, before I take that question, um, until, from now until I would say mid-May or so, we're going to collect feedback. So if you want to try out, I'm going to show you how you can try out. If you want to try out, play with it. Let us know what works or what doesn't work so we can fix it before we go for May. <laughs> Is there a plan to do a filter on the subscription? Uh, the framework we're using in, in Azure CLI does not allow that. We could do it for PowerShell, but we want to have that consistent experience. So we're going to try to find a way to do so. Um, for the release we're looking for build, we don't have that in the book, but it's something we can consider for the future. Oh, there is a typo, where? <laughs> I think it's I and E need to be swapped. Oh, okay, well, that's an easy fix. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the typo, first book uh, fixed, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do a PR, yes, <laughs> but we'll do it. <laughs> yes, um, so if you want the traditional experience, yes, we're gonna have a switch to disable this mechanism. Um, I can't remember on top of my head what parameter we're going to use, but yes, we have the ability to, switch, to disable it. Oh, not to switch to the old experience. I should be more precise. <laughs> cool. So, as I was saying, 
Um, <clears throat> if you want to try the preview, you have one URL to remember, aka.ms new AZ login. You have the QR code. I've tried to use a QR code to get the ak.ms link. I hope it works. <laughs> um, so I'm going to let that on for a, for a minute. Um, and that will redirect you to a blog post that has all the info, the links, where to install, how to install. Uh, we have two installation methods, one for Windows and one for Mac OS and Linux. Uh, they're different. Um, we have technical reason behind that. I don't want to go into details here, but uh, that's why we don't have the same installation path for both. But it works on both environments. All right. If I need to come back to that slide, you let me know. I'll, I'll do gladly. So <clears throat> the second topic I wanted to talk about today is authentication. Um, you may have been seeing, you may have seen a few things around uh, in the last few months or so. Um, there has been few issues around, um, around Azure. Um, so I wanted to touch base on security, uh, how we have different schemes to authenticate to Azure. And earlier today, earlier, this afternoon, someone was asking me about what are different schemes? What does service principle stands for? What do, when do I use managed identities? When do I use all those different things? So I went to cover that, and when we recommend which mechanism, when we recommend which mechanism. We're also looking at making it simpler, and also we want to make sure that we cover all the kind of, of, of scenario that fits your needs. So in this table, I've tried to gather all the different authentication method, method that exists to today and which one you should be using for interactive use and which one you should be using for non-interactive use and which one you should consider. So the first one is username and password. Any of you is still using username and password to do login to Azure, AZ login dash dash username dash dash password. I see no hands, good, good. It is not recommended to use that. And I'll come to that in a in couple of slides. Uh, so bear with me on this one. Interactive use today, this is the system browser authentication flows, the one you've seen, the one you're using on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you can also use device code flow if that is also something that you want to use in case you don't have a system browser, you're running into a Docker container, you're running into whatever headless environment and, and you want to be authenticated, you use the device flow. That's for interactive use. For non-interactive use, so if you're running your scripts, um, service principle would be the way to go, which is basically application identity or application IDs. I would recommend to use a, cer a certificate, um, subject name and identifier uh, in our docs, if you're looking for that. That's really the, today, kind of the, one of the most secure way to think of service principles. Otherwise, you just go to username and passwords for apps, and that's really not a good thing. <laughs> um, there are two other mechanisms that I think make sense to touch base if you have never or haven't heard of them. The first one is managed identities, uh, system managed identities or user managed identities. Both of them are basically uh, service principle managed um, that we allow you to do. So what a managed identity will allow is if you're running your script into Azure function, uh, you can give an identity to this function and when you're running operation against Azure, you can say, I want to use the identity of that function and then you give the permission on that function to whatever you want to do or you give the right role. So from your code point of view, you don't have to manage the uh, secrets in any way. It just use what identity is given to your function and that's an easier way to, to get there. The new mechanism that we have implemented, uh, it's been about a year now or so, is uh, Federated Identities or OpenIDC, OpenID Connect. Anyone has heard about that, Federated Identity or IDC? Uh, that's the 
mechanism that we recommend as well for GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps. It's supported in both environment. And it's the same idea. It's basically having a managed identity in, in non-Azure workloads. So you're running an ADO, you're running, again, GitHub Action. You don't have to get those secrets in those um, uh, environments, which can always be a problem uh, keeping a secret over there. And the last one that we have been in preview for about a year now is also the what we call WAM as a short name for Web Account Manager. WAM is basically a broker that will allow you to use your Windows account um, to store the identities that we use to Azure. So uh, I'll come, here it is. Uh, it's only on Windows today. Uh, it's a Windows 10 plus. Um, so anything that is above Windows 10, uh, it will work on those environments. It will do that broker for off and it will take your login account. So someone was asking, do we still have the pop-up window? The answer is no, we are going to use the Windows authentication flow to do that. And we don't have to rely on the system browser flow. It's much more efficient, I would say. It's faster to sign on using that mechanism. And it has an enhanced security as an example. It allows token protection, uh, which uh, keeps your token on your machine. And uh, it's a better way to secure your systems at the end of the day. Um, let me uh, could do a quick demo on this one. And for that, I will need my cheat sheet. And for non-Windows non -Windows user, it will still be the pop-up, uh, at least for now. Uh, there are, uh, we are talking of adding the ability to have one on other systems, um, but it's not there yet. So now if I'm doing an easy login, so I've, I've enabled the broker, this is today an opt-in mechanism, so it's not on by default, so you have to try it. Uh, but if you're doing a login now, the log, okay, oops. Oh, okay, let me try that again. All right, so let's make sure I get the right setting here. Okay, so I'm enabling the, the, the capability here on my machine and I'm going to run the AZ login. Okay. That should not be. Let's try again. All right. The demo gods are not with me today. Let me see. Uh, okay, I'll uh, try one more try, and uh, if that doesn't work, uh, you'll have to believe me. <laughs> nope. Okay. I'll, um, I'll look at that demo in a minute, but um, um, I don't know why it's not working. So technically it is using the login window. So you will get uh, that login, that window pop-up, you know, just like in the independent window on login with all your accounts. That's what is showing up. And once you've been authenticated, it will just move on. Yes. So the question is, is MSAL having that auth flow? Yes, MSAL is doing the auth flow for, for us on that. Um, it's one of the reasons we have been taking so much time to get it out, is we had a few issues that we discovered on the MCEL library when we implemented one, one with Azure CLI in Azure PowerShell. And in, um, in, uh, in, in that discovery, we had to go back to the MCEL team, have them fix few issues. Um, there is a lot of different flows that, are, that have to be supported with that um, one approach. Um, if you go to Azure Public, that's kind of straightforward. You have one account. But then we're thinking of how does it work with service principle? Uh, how does it work in other clouds? Like, you know, we have all those um, um, variations of Azure. Uh, so we wanted to test all those environments and we discovered a few issues that we wanted to address. Uh, 
Um, the good news is we've identified, we believe most of the issues, if not all. Uh, we had a call actually no later than yesterday to discuss what would be our next step. And we believe we're in a shape where we can make it GA again for May. So for our build release, that's our plan. Um, it will be the default authentication with Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell. So starting May 21st, that's going to be the new authentication flow. You will still be able to go back to the old one if you want to, to do so, uh, but that's going to be our default. Yes. Will anything similar come for MG Graph, uh, the Connect MG Graph? I am not sure. I would have to ask the Graph team. Uh, the, the question is, will there be any connection with BPOS? No, I, I'm not sure I got the question right. OK, we can take it offline, yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce today is we are deprecating the AZ login dash dash user dash dash password uh, command. Again, at build, that's going to go away. Uh, there are too many risks of password in clear, and it does not support any MFA requirements. Uh, so that authentication flow, uh, we've made the decision very recently to have it removed by build. So that's happening. <laughs> we know we're going to have some customers broken, so we're going to try to communi communicate as much as we can. But, but that's, I think it's the right thing to do. All right, um, we have like a few more minutes and I wanted to touch base on a few best practices. Um, I, <clears throat> I put a plain cockpit here because best practices is something that pilots have to keep in mind when they're flying. It's always something you want to keep in mind and it's not always something that shows up as, I would say, uh, obvious. It, it has, you have to go through it and remind it every, every day, every week, every month. So I may repeat a few things that you may have heard before, but stay up to date. Keep your clients up to date as much as you can. Uh, we will release on the first Tuesday of the month. Uh, we may have some exceptions like build. It's going to be the 21st of May, but we are trying to keep the cadence of first uh, Tuesday of the month. We update the libraries. We were talking of MSAL, the authentication library. We keep the MSAL up to date on a regular basis. We make sure that we follow those updates, which brings all security, uh, improvement, uh, security issues being addressed, uh, those kind of things. We don't want to have you running a client that could make uh, secrets leaked or having a token being stolen by someone else. So stay up to date. Um, we keep controlling the breaking change on the May and November releases. So that's really when we make those big breaking changes. We are trying to announce as early as we can when those breaking changes will happen. I don't know if you've seen in our docs, but our content developers are doing a fantastic job on keeping us up to date. What's coming? What is upcoming breaking changes? And you have those pages that are listing all the commands that are going to have a breaking change. So you can look at those and say, oh, my script is going to be impacted by that. So no, hold on, I'm going to review it. Um, so we're trying to make sure we communicate that as much as we can. Um, one thing that we, I want to announce, I didn't write it because we're still uh, addressing a few things here and there. But we are looking at announcing at Build the notion of a long-term support of Azure Client Tools. The idea would be you would be able to skip the November release and stay on a Build generation for a year. So, we're working on the wording here, but let's say the release we will have at build this year, you would have to update um, for the non-breaking change version. So you keep your script up to date, uh, you keep your script. And then in November, we do another breaking change release, but that's fine. You don't have to update this one. You can stay on, the, that, on that generation until build next year. So that gives you a longer period of time to keep your script and have more flexibility to maintain them. Um, so we're working on the announcement here. I'm just giving you a sneak preview of what we have in mind. Uh, but that's, that's something we're working on and we really want to make that available for you on, on, this, on this build. I hope it's going to help your life. <laughs> um, 
Intune notification, I mentioned that yesterday briefly in the, in the set of the shell. We have implemented for Azure CLI and Azure PowerShell that notification of, hey, there is a new version. Um, so you know when it's, it's there and you know if there is a breaking change announced when you're using the command that you might be impacted by it. So keep those warnings in, in loop. Um, we've done a really good job, I think, um, of cleaning up the stored warning of break, upcoming breaking changes. We had, I think we had over 70 stored breaking change warning in Azure PowerShell that had been there for more than a year and a half. And the teams had not touched them. They were here and no one cared about it. So we've cleaned all of them. We've worked with every single service team at Microsoft to make sure that the upcoming, upcoming breaking change warning messages were accurate and current. And, and uh, we believe we have a good list uh, now that is, that is going to be reasonable and, and that you can trust. Um, finally, authentication and credentials, we talk about it, but consider using managed identities and OIDCs in preference of our service principles as, as a thumb of rule when you can. Uh, be careful of secrets. I mentioned that uh, as well yesterday. We have the detection of secret that is coming. Uh, rotate your keys, secrets, and keep in mind that DevOps pipelines may expose secrets in the logs. Uh, and when you have a secret in your log, uh, someone was mentioning yesterday in the side note, uh, side meeting room, that when it's there, it's there forever, and you pretty much, pretty much have lost the access to that secret, or you've exposed to anyone. So make sure you keep those logs protected and um, that you know who can access them. Review the different authentication approach so you're actually keeping those things uh, tidy. And do not leave tokens behind. Uh, if you're running a script, don't forget the logout step. <laughs> Even if it's an agent that is supposed to be ephemeral, uh, make sure you clean your, your steps behind you. Three takeaways, and that if there is one thing you have to keep in mind is those um, new login experience coming. Um, think of WAM as the default, and a few best practices, few tips and tricks I've shared with you. Um, I wanted to get five minutes for Q&A. Uh, we're right on time. <laughs> so uh, if you have more questions, if there is any topic you want to dive a bit further, I can try to fix my demo as well. Uh, that's also something we can do in the next five minutes. So uh, go for it. If not, you feel free to go and have a coffee or enjoy the sun. Thank you. <laughs>